Um, this next question. Hi, my name is Ivy, and I thought, and I had a thought the other day. Evie, Ivy, sorry. Um, these days, fountain pen friendly paper are made with sizing agents, either with chemicals infused throughout the paper or plastics like styrene, acrylic, polyurethane, etc. when mm. it is a coating. Mm. All of these methods are creations of modern day technologies, but fountain pens, even pens that write with some kind of nib, go pretty far back. Mm -hmm. uh, we think a lot about vintage pens, but not often enough about vintage paper. So my question is, how did paper, uh, people paper, mm. how did people from the past get paper that didn't feather or bleed or didn't show through, no ghosting, etc.? What are um, ancient fountain pen friendly papers made from? So I think by ancient, we're talking more like, you know, uh, pre 1950s, I guess, you know, when fountain pens were brand new. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty interesting question this mm -hmm. is the uh deep dive one that i didn't want to answer this is the deep one. and this is what brian added to our notes so i'm going yep. to go to bed as you're reading the question i was thinking of the uh dunder mifflin song the people people person paper, paper people people, people. dunder mifflin the people persons paper people okay. no 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 uh, we're gonna get we're gonna get content stricken right, on that one so, um by singing the song no okay all right, Drew, take a, take a, take a lean back, take a snooze, because I got a lot to talk <laughs> about here. And actually, as you were reading the question again, I was like, oh, I, I didn't even go into that part of no! it. No! But I'm not going to, okay. <laughs> so, uh, full disclaimer, this is gonna be a long question. If you're totally bored by this entire topic, just skip to the next question. We have timestamps for that reason. Okay. I will definitely add timestamps. Uh, I also may and probably will go beyond what I actually know and what I'm talking about, and I may or may not realize it, so, not only take a, a grain of salt, but lump a heap of salt over this whole topic. I'm gonna share with you what I think I know, and then you can either validate it or passively accept it and then move on with your life because it doesn't really matter, or you can dive in deeper and correct me. I'm cool with any of those options. Your preamble is longer than some questions we've answered now. Uh, well, this is what you're gonna get. This is old school Brian Q&A right here. Oh, when I man. didn't even have Drew and I was just drooling on and on. Okay, so the short answer to this question, this is the TLDR or the TLDL, too long know. didn't I listen, answer the question. Um, is that uh, there really is no ancient fountain pen friendly paper. Um, yeah, really like paper that you would write on with a fountain pen in general is, is really not ancient. It's like 120, 130 years old. Maybe you consider that ancient, but when you take it in the perspective of like how long humans have written things down, that's my little water bottle. Oh in my case God. You're wondering, it's like, it's ice. I thought ice. it was an, a bug or something. No, like. it's ice water in here. It's a little bubble that's like popping up. Anyway, I don't know if you can hear that on the mic, but clearly got Drew's attention. <laughs> I didn't know what um, that was. So yeah, there is no ancient fountain pen friendly paper. So I got to nuance that a little bit. Um, you know, papers, paper as we know it, you're talking basically like wood pulp paper fairly new, especially in mass quantities available to like the general population. It's, it's, it's pretty new in the grand scope of human history. Um, writing as a whole has been an evolution. So I won't get super deep into it, but basically it's been a, a few thousand years of writing things down. Started out with things like cuneiform, which was like carved into like clay tablets. Of course you had like the cave drawings with painting on rock, these types of things. You could, you could get into any of these with, um, you know, what you define as a writing surface. Um, but paper really is is kind of wood pulp paper. So if you're talking about paper in its modern form, it really started uh, in China around 105 AD. So about 2000 years or so. Um, didn't spread outside of China until about the eighth century. Um, and so uh, there were other writing surfaces that were similar to that, like you had parchment, you had papyrus, you know, that's like reed based, that came out of like Egypt and stuff. Mm. Um, you had vellum, you know, things that were made of like animal skin, but none of them were like ground up wood or cotton pulp, like the cellulosic fiber pulp paper that that is the stuff that we're using and the stuff that m mainly fountain pens are made for. Um, that That was really not popular until much more recently. Um, so the wood pulp paper and the automated machines used to produce it in mass quantities basically arrived around the time that fountain pens also came to be, around the mid-1800s. Uh, so there really wasn't a period where you had massive quantities of pulp-based paper, but no fountain pens or, or anything to write it on. So 
I would say like the evolution of the writing surfaces evolved like in tandem with the writing implements and the ink and things that were used. So we've talked before about like the trifecta of pen, ink, and paper. Right. Kind of the evolution of writing things down, there was a trifecta of pen, ink, and paper or whatever form that was that all kind of evolved together. So there was always that relationship there. Um, so this is where we could cut some stuff out if you want to, Drew. I'm going to give you an out. I'm going to let you I can go flex deep those onto Q&A like muscles, my friend. Makes, you go for it. Like how wood pulp paper is made because I've been getting asked this for a long time. I knew some of the basics, but I went even deeper for myself than I have before. And this is where it can get to deep nerd territory if you want to. So I'm giving you an out. I'm letting you s- seal the fate of the people that are listening right now. All right, well, let's... Do you want to go there or not? Let's, let's stick to what... IVEV wanted to know about okay. how were like when fountain pens were a thing before our modern chemicals were used. Okay. Why was it still fountain pen friendly, even though they did not have access to these modern treatments like we use today? Yeah. Uh, the truth of that is I don't really know because the 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 way that we associate like modern fountain pen friendly ink paper stuff like that that wasn't really a thing back when fountain pens were first coming about in the early 1900s. That was really the heyday. So you think about like the history of writing things down. It was really for a pretty elite group of people for a long time. Even just like being able to read, being able to write, it was a pretty, it was was like a trade craft. It was for the aristocrats, the elites of most societies until... I don't know, the 1800s, you know, especially in Western uh, culture, uh, it, it was not something that like, became about until kind of the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. So the idea of like education, being able to read for every individual to have a writing implement and carrying it around with them, that was revolutionary around that time. And that's when fountain pens came about. Before that, you had dip pens, dip ink. You have, if you wanted to write something down, especially in a portable fashion, you had to have this like big box filled with all your implements. And most of your paper was probably like animal skin based. It was extremely laborious and expensive to produce. So nobody was like journaling out their thoughts of the day. Like you would correspond with a long lost family member, or you would write down important like business or government documents, religious documents and things like that. And that was kind of it. Unless you were like keeping a historical record of something really important, you were not just like writing casually because it was so expensive mm-hmm. and hard to do. So, so really there was only nice paper back then. There was no cheap crappy paper because everything needed to be fountain it's, pen friendly. It's hard very... to say because I don't have any of this stuff. You no, know what I mean? And like, yes, there are historical documents that are that old, the constitution, and, you know, all the declaration of independence and all these types of things. For, but like those are on like parchment type paper. But again, those are like very official. They've been kept very well. I don't know what those were like to write on back then and that kind of thing. I don't think that most people like really thought about the writing experience back then. I think it was very utilitarian. It was pretty much like you had a task to do. Could the paper like hold up? Could it withstand? People weren't thinking like, oh, this feels kind of scratchy. Oh, there's ghosting on the back of this page. They didn't really think like to my knowledge, that was not really a concern at that time. Mm. It was like, I need to write this thing down. I need to communicate this piece of business so that I can do my proper accounting. Is it accomplishing that? Great. And that was kind of it. You know, it wasn't really a a romantic kind of thing like maybe we associate it to be. Uh, it was much more utilitarian. So I think as long as you're able to get the job done, you did it. Uh, and I think too, like maybe the misnomer with if you're thinking about 100 years ago or 150 years ago, the ink was very different back then. That's very, a good point. very different. So you didn't have the same modern fountain pen ink that was very flowy and shading and sheen and all this. It was pretty much like grind up oak galls to make iron gall ink. You had like pigment based, like China ink, India ink, sometimes called lawyer's ink. That was about it. Like you didn't have color options. It was black ink, and that was your only choice. And it was thick because it was previously used with reeds or quills or dip pens. So when fountain pens first started to come out, they were for one, not very reliable. They leaked a lot, you know, so people carrying them around, it was like not the most convenient thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they gushed ink. They would, you know, 
because they were still figuring out the the science behind how to make ink flow through a pen and the ink itself varied a lot and it was not mass produced for especially at the beginning there in the late 1800s um, it was not it was not something that was nearly as standardized as today a lot of people were making their own ink out of like natural materials so it it's it's the properties themselves, you know, the thicker ink would not have feathered as much. Exactly. Yeah, that's you know what, what I mean? was thinking. Like right now, everything's water based, and right. water inherently is going to absorb very quickly into, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of papers, most papers, unless it's got a heavy coating where it sits on top for a while. Right. And so back then, I mean, water based is a pretty modern, you know, method of creating ink, right? I believe so. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'm, um, uh, but you know, this is where I'm not a hundred percent sure. Yeah, it's like what is modern? You know, I would say modern. Modern would be like since the fountain pen was invented. In terms of writing, modern is the last hundred and fifty years because right. that's when it really exploded and became available to the masses, so to speak. You know, you had like the printing press. You had ways to distribute and read, but individuals writing things down really didn't happen until the industrial revolution. So I think like. It was very utilitarian at first. And then when you had the Industrial Revolution, the boom of chemistry and physics that happened in the early 1900s, that drastically improved paper paper producing technology. It drastically improved pen technology and things like plastics and other like hard rubber, ebonite, these types of things. You had casein, bakelite, all these materials that were starting to come out in pens and ink as well, ink chemistry. Uh, these were all changing and starting to, um, you know, become more reliable, which then like, you know, more affordable. There were a lot more options. So I would say like, you know, really the whole fountain pen story is about, you know, modern writing. Uh, and it's, you know, if, if you look at it in the grand scheme of things, um, if you look at it really like since the invention of the fountain pen, there's been an evolution even from, you know, the materials that were used, the designs of the pens, but but really the ink has had, seen a huge difference um, as well as some of the paper. Now I will say like paper wise, I just don't know like decade by decade what paper was like in like the early 1900s and all that there's just not a lot of solid information out there that I've been able to find. Maybe it's somewhere, but not specifically related to how fountain pens performed with mm -hmm. it, you know, because back then it wasn't like fountain pens was like separated as this whole other class of thing. Like it is now fountain pens. They were just pens. That's just what people wrote with. Yeah. There were really no pen and pacer, pa uh, pen and paper enthusiasts because it was such a utility. More or less. Yeah. So it's like to find specific, maybe I'm wrong and maybe there's better information out there, but I'm not aware of it. Um, now, if we want to deep dive a little bit onto the actual manufacture of the paper. If you want to add anything, it's pretty you fascinating, guess. but I think we could be teetering on the edge of total boredom uh, for most people. But uh, I would say related specifically to the question that was asked, talking about like sizing and coatings and stuff like that. You mentioned like, okay, Evie, you mentioned like styrene, acrylic, polyurethane, all that kind of stuff. I don't even know how to approach this without going so deep. So I'm just going to go deep. Screw it. Okay. <laughs> that could have gone one so, or two ways. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to lean into it. Okay. So wood pulp paper, this is what we're talking about. So it's, it's paper that has some absorbency to it, right? As opposed to like limestone, like carving into limestone, right? Oh, right like that right. was like how things were done back in the Greek times and whatnot. Um, okay. So as all good researchers do, I looked it up on Wikipedia first um, to just talk about like, what is wood pulp paper? mainly because they phrase it well. Um, so timber resources used to make wood pulp are referred to as pulp wood. Did you know that, Drew? That, that makes sense. Uh, while in theory, any tree can be used for pulp making, coniferous trees are preferred because of the cellulose fibers in the pulp of these species are longer and therefore make stronger paper. Duh. Mm. Some, of the <laughs> some of the most commonly used softwood trees for paper making include spruce, pine, fir, larch, and hemlock, and hardwoods such as eucalyptus, aspen and birch so just in case you were curious which trees might be used those are some of the best ones so it involves some sort of cellulose fiber often wood pulp but you can also make it out of like cotton and other other cellulosic materials um, lignin and hemicelluloses plus bleach and water and a number of other things depending on the process so this is where we start to fall down the hole Grab on. All right, what makes some paper better than others? Okay, so it has to do with the type of wood itself. So like the quality of the wood, the species of the tree and so on, how it's refined, 
is the bark all taken off these types of things so like it's a natural material right so just like if you have you know denim jeans you know you have like your raw denim like your really high grade or right. le leather like full grain full hide no defects that kind of stuff it's like there's different grades to it you can have the same thing with paper so garbage in garbage out you start with a high quality hmm. pulp and you're going to get a better paper that's part of it the process used to make the pulp i'm just going to list the names of the processes and not explain them because they're very boring. Mechanical, thermochemical, chemi-thermochemical, chemical, recycled or de-inked, organoslav or biopulping. Did you just say organoslav to me? Organoslav, deal with it. No. So these are all wood pulp processing processes. Yes. It's literally just for the pulp. Then the amount of lignin or, you know, the, the you know, it's a part of the wood pulp um, that's that's removed. That's acidic. The more of that that's left in there, the more the paper is going to break down over time and it can affect the absorbency and stuff like that. The chemicals used for bleaching and neutralizing it, which if you have like high quality paper like Clairefontaine Rhodia, it's pH free, you know, pH neutral, sorry, acid free. That is going to help the paper last longer because if you have a high pH or a lot of acid in it, it's going to break down on its own. So anyway, if archivability is important to you. You want neutral, pH neutral and acid free. Um, the purity of the water is actually really important. There's a lot of water used. In fact, most paper mills are located like on a river or something like that. You're right. Um, yeah, that's because it takes a ton of water to oh. produce wood pulp paper. And the purity of that water actually has a huge influence on the quality of the paper. And they smell really yeah, bad. They do. Um, and, uh, you know, you want an absence of other contaminants in that water as well. So that has a lot to do with it. The, um, there's a calcium carbonate or chalk that can be added for neutrality. It also adds to the ink resistance and smoothness of the paper. So that's kind of another element that gets added to it, depending on how the paper is going to be used, et cetera. You add chalk to it. There are pigments that can be added that can color the paper, but also adds to some UV resistance of the paper. There are optical brightening agents as well, which add to some UV resistance and do some other things that I didn't feel like reading. And um, there's a there's a site called jacksonart.com that talks about, and this is where I pulled some of this from, um, to give them full credit, and we'll have a link to it in the show notes. Um, but that uh, really breaks down like some of the, some of the aspects of... Um, uh, how nice paper is made as well. So their site says the amount of size used in paper making will alter the absorbency of the paper. Unless the paper is water leaf and completely absorbent, like blotter paper, you know, you've seen blotting paper, mm -hmm. or like if you have a Tomoe River and like the first page on the on the um, pad, you know, like the pads, there's like a one page of it that's blotter paper. Anyway, okay. so blotter paper is very absorbent because there's no sizing. Um, anyway, most fine art papers, uh, both soft size, which is quite absorbent, or uh, like cotton and wood-based relief print papers, and hard size, which is much less absorbent, like most fountain pen friendly paper, hard sizing is less absorbent, um, uh, will have a degree of internal sizing. So this is usually made of a methyl cellulose, cellulose or alkyl ketene dimer, let's, AKD. Let's pretend one of us doesn't know what sizing is. Okay, sizing, it's literally just a term used for like the stuff that's put in paper. It's sort of like a, I guess it's a coating, but it's like a, it's like a, it's like a chemical, I guess, or something that's added to the paper to, to give it. So does it have anything to do with It has nothing to do with dimensions. like how big something is now. So, no, it's okay. a different, it's a different term. Okay. So think of it in terms of like, if you're, if you're adding like flour to bake a cake, it's like the flour to the cake, you know, uh, uh, recipe. So like the primary component? It's a pretty important component. Okay. Yeah, it, flowers the amount important. of sizing you have will drastically impact how the paper performs. Okay. Um, yeah, good question though. Uh, I would explain it better if I understood it better. Um, external sizing, so that's, so that's when you like mix it in. External sizing is when the formed paper sheets are soaked in a tub of gelatine made from animal bones and hides modified vegetable starch, potato, rice, or wheat, or acrylic coke polymer to form a water repellent film on the surface of the paper. So you can add these like water resistant properties inside when you make the stuff to give it some like 
you know, ink repellent kind of properties. And you can also basically like coat it with the stuff to get, to give like an even more water resistance thing, depending on what it's going to be used for. Like watercolor paper, for example, you want like complete ink resistance because you want that stuff to sit on the surface. So you would do like internal and external sizing. Fountain pen paper, you can have a mixture of any of these mm -hmm. things. And what's wonderful about the fountain pen world is no manufacturer says any of this stuff. <laughs> and like nobody classifies yeah. any of it. Maybe they say pH neutral and acid free. Maybe, and maybe they call it water, water uh, color. And maybe they say fountain pen friendly or ink resistant. That's about all you're gonna get. Yeah. Along with like a paper weight. So that's pretty much what's going on when it comes to the manufacture of paper. It's super complex and it's really variable and it's extremely expensive, resource consuming, time consuming to produce any type of paper. And basically fountain pens are not anyone's reason why paper is made. We are pretty much dealing with like what's already made out there how do we take from that and turn it into a fountain pen friendly product? So there is no paper mill in the world, I would be willing to bet, maybe Clairefontaine. There's nobody in the world that's thinking like, let's make this good for fountain pens. Yeah. Because it's such a small portion worldwide of total paper usage that it's like not even like a blip on their radar. So going recently with the Tomoe River changes that we're dealing with, that right. everybody's talking about. It's like a total afterthought for the company that makes that paper. It's such a small portion. It's like the scraps of the scraps of the scraps to them because it has to be produced in such large quantities um, that, you know, it's just not something that's primarily being designed with fountain pen inks and stuff like that in mind. So we're left kind of like having to make assumptions, having to get not that great information, partial information. We can talk about the principles of how paper is made and all these things, but I could not tell you any of the papers that we carry, what the sizing is, what it's made of, just about anything. And even like being in the business, trying to ask questions about this, I'm not talking to like the paper yeah. engineers at the mills. Like where are so many steps removed from the raw manufacturer of this paper that even we can't really get good answers for you. So it's, we're kind of all just left to like, well, we don't really know what it is, so let's just test it out and see what we all agree is the better paper. And then when it changes, we're all just left scrambling, wondering why and what to do about it, like we are with Tomoe right now. Yeah. And uh, that's the best we can do. That's all I got for you. There's oh. your deep dive. All right. Is that too painful? Um, no. Did we find our limit? Did we find the limit of where we should go on a question? Oh, oh well, I, I, I was done right before you said, <laughs> now comes the deep dive. I thought that, <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah, let us know your thoughts on that, whether or not Brian was uh, accurate on any of that or whether or not he was just talking about a bunch of uh, pulp fiction. <laughs> well done, sir. Well right. done, sir. Um, All right. I was thinking I was ready for that like 30 minutes ago. You heard me. Uh,